Hello, this is Mrs. Mattingly again, and um, this is another uh, pre-lecture collaborate before you have your in-class lecture on acute uh, neurology. This one we're going to focus on cerebrovascular accidents, CBAs, um, also known as stroke, also known as brain attack. We're going to be looking at pathology, risk, prevention, and general types. We're going to go into a lot more detail in class as far as symptomatology that's related to where the actual CVA incident is. But we're going to do an overview in this one. The next couple of slides are going to be your outcomes and your QSIN statement. So I'm just going to click through those. OK, here we are at the very first slide on the actual content. And I like the picture that I've got in here because it really um, kind of puts it together for me. Um, so we're, for the most part in the, uh, in the lecture, I'm going to call uh, this a CVA, or a cerebral vascular accident. Sometimes I'll probably also say, also say stroke. But they're, they're, they are synonymous, OK? So the bottom line is that a CVA is going to result from either a hemorrhage from a tear in the wall or from an impairment of the cerebral circulation causing partial or complete occlusion. And like I mentioned, we can sometimes call this a stroke or a brain attack. Um, what happens is we actually have an actually, we have death of the brain cells and then as a result ending up with long-term disability. Uh, CBA is the fourth major health concern in America affecting uh, 795,000 per year. It's also the fourth leading cause of death. Um, where the actual loss of function um, and the specifics of that loss of function varies depending on the location and the extent of the brain tissue that's involved. But that impact can be physical, cognitive, and emotional. It can, uh, people who have CDAs often have uh, problems with uh, in, impulse inhibition, and they can actually go through what we perceive as a personality change. Of those that survive, about 15 to 30 percent will um, also have permanent disabilities as a result of the CBA. There are some risk factors. Some are modifiable and some are not modifiable. This is the list that are uh, non-modifiable. Um, age. It tells you here that the risk doubles uh, each decade after 55. And in fact, about two-thirds of the strokes uh, occur in individuals who are over the age of 65. Uh, CVAs are more common in men than in women. However, more women die from a CVA. Um, ethnicity and race, there is a higher incidence in African Americans, um, both in the rate of stroke and the morbidity and mortality from the stroke. Um, that might be because there's some other comorbidities that are also more prevalent amongst African Americans, such as hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. And hereditary and family history does play an impact. Um, an individual with a history of a family having a CBA has an increased risk of having a CBA. There is some research going into uh, genetic coding to try to further identify uh, that linkage. <coughs> we do, however, have quite a few modifiable risks. And what we mean by modifiable are these are risk factors that we can do something about. I've, there's a nice list here. I'm just going to comment on a few of them. Hypertension is the single most important modifiable risk factor. But um, in addition to people not choosing to have managed their hypertension, we continue to have a huge problem in this nation of people that are hypertensive and don't even know that they're hypertensive. Um, also, heart disease, particularly AFib. If um, AFib really uh, ratchets up the risk of having a CDA. Some other cardiac diseases would include an MI, um, cardiac valve abnormalities, um, uh, congenital cardiac factors, those types of things. Um, obesity is definitely um, a risk factor. And we're talking about a BMI greater than 30 there. Um, some things that we can do is we think that a diet that is high in fat 
and low in fruits and vegetables can increase the risk of a CVA so we can change our diet away from that pattern in order to lower the risk. Uh, there are also uh, several comorbidities that are associated with the risk of stroke, and I've got those listed for you. Um, AFib is responsible for about 20% of all uh, CVAs, and as we age, that incidence increases. Um, it, it increases the risk of CVA in women by five times, and that risk is even greater in men. Um, the last item on here is a history of a transient ischemic attack, or TIA, and I'm going to cover TIAs in the next couple of slides. When we're talking about risk factors and we're thinking about CZAs, why is it so important for us to worry about that? Why is it important for us to worry about prevention? Um, the public in general lacks knowledge, and in fact, about 80% of CDAs are preventable. People don't recognize the signs and symptoms of CVAs, and so they don't seek help quickly. And time lost is basically brain, brain cells lost. And to kind of really pull it together, if you think about the loss of one minute of ischemia, that's equivalent to the loss of three weeks of memory. People tend to not think of the symptoms as really emergency. Oh, I, I'll just see if this goes away. So again, we're losing uh, time. If you ask someone on the street the symptoms of a CVA, most people can't tell you. This is just a very brief, brief, brief review of cerebral circulation. Um, I'm just going to touch on a few things, but this slide is here for you to refer back to. The blood supply to the brain comes from two major pairs of arteries, the internal carotid and the vertebral. Look in your book for, they have a good little summary there about details of cerebral circulation. I want you to remember that the brain is a very high consumer of our blood supply. The, blo the brain needs about 20% of our cardiac output. It needs a constant supply of both oxygen and glucose. We talked about that way back when we were talking about increased intracranial pressure. 30 seconds of loss of blood flow will result in a change in metabolism from a neurological standpoint. Two minutes, we're going to have the neurological metabolism is just going to stop. And at five minutes, that results in cellular death. Remember that the factors that impact cerebral blood flow include systemic blood pressure, cardiac output, and blood viscosity. And again, you can look in your book for a good uh, conversation on cerebral circulation. Prevention. Healthy diet, weight control, regular exercise, no smoking, limit to alcohol consumption, and routine health assessments. I've got that picture over there kind of for visual people. You can see if you read the little torn pieces of paper there that it actually has some of those things on there. We continue to need to focus on patient education. Stroke screenings are an ideal opportunity to lower stroke risk. Um, we do know that uh, the low-dose aspirin may lower the risk of stroke, particularly in women. We want people to eat a low-fat diet, low cholesterol. We want them to increase their exercise. I talked a minute ago about what a big impact AFib has on the occurrence of CDAs. So we want people with AFib to get treated for AFib and follow the treatment regime. Sometimes they need to change lifestyle changes. Um, we still have a problem with type 2 di diabetes, and as a matter of fact, we're seeing type 2 diabetes begin to not only increase in general in the population, but to be prevalent, uh, increasingly prevalent, even in um, younger and younger people and even in children at this time. But regardless of all those things, the hypertension is still the most important modifiable risk factor that we can talk about. There are some things that we can do as preventative treatment and secondary prevention for people that we've already determined that are at risk for a CVA. Um, and this is usually done in people who've had a TIA or if they've got some other risk factor. Uh, but as far as um, drug therapy is concerned, we utilize um, drugs to reduce the risk of thrombus and embolus. The use of antiplatelets is extremely common, and the most common antiplatelet that we see is aspirin, and that's a low dose of aspirin, usually 81 
325 milligrams daily. There are others that we use uh, also as well, including um, Dipraminamol, which is Persantine. That is an old, old drug. Um, they used that a ton when I first got out of school. Um, Clopridogel, which is Plavix, and Ticloprenamide, which is Ticlid. There's also some things we can do from a surgical intervention standpoint, the first of which is a carotid endurectomy, which we can abbreviate as CEA. And this is where we go in and remove the lesion. This is, would be the best option if we needed to go in and do some type of surgical intervention. However, some people cannot tolerate this because of other comorbidities. So some other things we can do is an angioplasty, or we can go in and do some stenting. And an angioplasty, we're just going to go in with a balloon. You learned about angioplasties when you studied cardiac. The same concept, we're going to go with a, in with a balloon to open the stenosed artery. Stenting, same concept as cardiac. Bypass, uh, an ECIC bypass, all that is, is it's a bypass that connects a extracranial artery to an intracranial artery. And the idea is just to go around the, the area of blockage. This is in here again as a visual. Um, it's another way to think about three steps to stroke rec recognition. Um, remember, we still need to do public education. Uh, people delay treatment. Uh, time loss equals brain loss. I mean, that's the easiest way for me to say it. Um, so this is just another way to come to talk about it. Something that's not covered in this three steps of recognition are changes in vision and changes in cognition. But those are also signs of a stroke that we would want to respond to. OK, I told you I was going to talk about TIAs. Um, a TIA is associated with an increased risk of a CVA. The thing about a TIA is it's transient. It's, it's usually focal. And we do not have an actual infarction of the brain. Usually those symptoms are going to last less than an hour, but they can last a little longer. So the actual practical definition of a TIA is whenever we have symptoms that last less than 24 hours. TIAs should be treated as medical emergencies. Uh, we need to teach people who are at risk for TIAs to seek medical attention immediately with any stroke-like symptoms. It's important for them also, when they present, to be able to identify the time of the onset uh, so that we get some idea of how long we've had problems with uh, blood flow perfusion. There's no way to know whether or not a TIA is going to resolve itself or whether it's going to go ahead and progress and develop into a CVI, CVI, CVA, CVA. Um, we need to consider TIAs as warning signs of progressive cardiovascular disease. This is a wake-up call. The signs and symptoms of the TIA depend on the blood vessel that's involved in the area of the brain that is being deprived of oxygen or the area of the brain that is ischemic. Um, whenever we think about uh, TIAs, the way I would encourage you to do is think in thirds. So in general, and this is in general, a third of people who experience a TIA will not have another event. That's it. One third will have additional TIAs, and one third will progress on into a stroke. The next slide gives you some visual looks at these. So the, it's got a couple things on this slide. One of this just talks about the risk, the risk of a CVA after a TIA, and it talks about it even pulling down into like, even into that first month, first year. Then there's a little picture of a, CV, of a TIA also there. And then once the person has had a risk factor, these are risk factors for a CVA post-TIA. Age greater than 60, you can see hypertension. And I've got some uh, guidelines there for you. Diabetes mellitus, and I've given you an, AC, uh, an A1C reading. Um, an elevated LDL over 100, a BMI greater than 30, and of course the smoking and the alcohol. The message out of this slide is that we need to take TIAs very, very seriously because they are, again, they are a warning sign that we're at risk for CVA. 
there are a couple of types of CVAs that we're going to talk about. We're going to classify those based on their underlying patho. So you've got ischemic and you've got hemorrhagic. And the ischemic accounts for about 80% and the hemorrhagic accounts for about 15 to 20%. A key element with CVAs is that a CVA results in infarction and cellular death. There's a really good chart in your book. It's chart 58-2. It gives you an excellent overview of the types of CVAs. Ischemic CVAs are the result of inadequate blood flow to the brain due to either a complete or partial occlusion of an artery. A TIA is usually a precursor of an ischemic CVA. That means that if a person has a TIA, then, then followed by a CVA, it's likely that that CVA is ischemic. When you think about um, ischemic, think about plug, that that artery has been plugged. I'm going to go into more detail on the next slides about both types of, um, of CVAs, the ischemic and the hemorrhagic. And then you've got these pictures here. And these pictures are actually taken out of your book. So you can also look at your book for these pictures. OK. Um, ischemic uh, CVAs result from an inadequate blood flow to the brain from either a partially or completely occluded artery. Underneath of ischemic CVAs, we can have two different types, either a thrombotic or an embolic. Arthrosclerosis, which is the hardening and thickening of the veins, is a major cause of ischemic CVAs. Um, this can lead to thrombus formation and contribute to emboli. 80%, and I told you this earlier, but 80% of all CVAs are ischemic. With an ischemic CVA, the lumen of the blood vessel becomes narrowed. And if it becomes occluded, then we're going to have an in, uh, infarction. Uh, thrombus uh, develops readily where there's arthrosclerotic plaques that have already narrowed the blood vessels. So you're looking at either a thrombus or narrowing. Again, most, uh, the most common type of ischemic CVA is a thrombotic CVA, and that's at 60%. Um, Two-thirds are associated with hypertension and diabetes mellitus, and about 30 to 50% of the cases are preceded by a TIA. Part of the reason that diabetes and hypertension are such big risk factors is that they both accelerate the development of arthrosclerosis. The extent of the stroke depends on how rapid the onset was, how big the damaged area is, and whether or not the um, brain has had time to develop collateral circulation. Most people who have an ischemic CVA do not have a decreased level of consciousness in the first 24 hours unless it's a brain stem CVA, or there's other conditions that are comorbid, such as seizures, increased intracranial pressure, or hemorrhage. Typically, ischemic CVA symptoms will continue to progress in the first 72 hours as the infarction and cerebral edema increase. So you just see that continue to progress. <coughs> the next kind of ischemic CVA is embolic. And this happens whenever you've got an embolus. And the way to think of this one, think of this as a mobile CVA. Because what's happening is you've got an embolus that's coming from another part of the body. So you've got this embolus, and it lodges in one of the cerebral arteries, and it gets stuck there. Okay, And then that causes the infarction. And then from there, you have the edema to the area that's supplied by the artery. Um, embolic strokes can affect any age. Um, but the most common uh, situation of an embolic stroke is um, arising from the arthrosclerotic plaques in older adults. The most common site from which we're going to get the emboli, emboli is the endocardial layer of the heart. And things like AFib that I talked about earlier, AFib is a huge um, impact on the development of an embolic uh, CBA. There are some other heart conditions as well. We also can have um, uh, an embolus that comes from uh, fat and air embolus from the long bone. Um, we're less likely to see warning factors with an embolic CBA as opposed to a thrombotic uh, CBA. 
usually then you're going to have symptoms that appear rapidly, giving very little time for the brain to develop that collateral circulation. Um, let's see. Usually they're going to stay conscious, although typically they are going to complain of a headache. Uh, the prognosis depends on the amount of time that the blood, brain tissue was deprived of the blood supply and the um, size of the um, tissue amount of the brain that's being impacted. It's um, as far as an embolic CVA, it's common for there to be a reoccurrence unless the underlying cause is being aggressively uh, treated. And that makes sense if you think about it, because remember this is like a moving or mobile CVA is what I like to think of it. So you've got some other problem going on in your body elsewhere, and as a result, you're having an embolus that then makes its way to the brain. So if you're not going to solve that problem in the other part of the body, you're just going to have a repeat of the problem. Hemorrhagic uh, CVAs account for about 15% um, of all CVAs, and this is when you have an actual bleed, and the bleed can go into either the brain tissue itself <coughs> or the subarachnoid space or ventricles. And you can see up here I've got the intraparenchymal hemorrhage, and all that intraparenchymal means is that's the functioning part of the brain. In other words, it's the neurons and the glial cells, okay? I'll talk about each type of hemorrhagic CBA in the following slides. Okay, an intracerebral hemorrhage accounts for 10% of all CBAs, and 50% of the death from an intracerebral hemorrhage will occur within the first 48 hours. This happens when you have a rupture of a vessel, you've got a sudden onset of symptoms, <clears throat> that bleeding is continuing, so you're going to see a progression of the symptoms because of the bleeding. The prognosis is very poor. We've got a 30-day a thir a mortality of about 40 to 80 percent. And we're coming back to that hypertension again is the most common cause. The extent of symptoms varies. It depends, again, on the amount, location, and duration of the bleeding. And this type of CVA typically or commonly happens during activity. What you see as far as symptoms, <clears throat> you can have neurological deficits, headache, nausea, vomiting, decreased level of comp consciousness, and hypertension. About half of the intracerebral hemorrhages occur in the putamen and internal capsule, which is the central white matter. Um, the um, thalamus, the cerebellar hemispheres, and the pons. The putamen is a large structure. It's in the inner brain. Just think about it being in the inside of the brain, is this way for me to describe it. It sits a little bit above the thalamus, and it's involved in a really uh, pretty complex feedback loop that helps us to move um, our, all of our extremities. The internal capsule is white matter and it contains both ascending and descending axions, and um, this, has, this area has a very high concentration of neurons, and so when it's affected, this will impact a very wide array of functions. Um, if you've got a hemorrhage in the pons, this is the most serious because that's where our basic life support functions are, uh, for example, respiration, and so those are very quickly affected and we're going to really see that patient decline rapidly and have a high, um, a high risk of death. Um, you would see a hemorrhage in the pons characterized uh, starting out with maybe with hemoplegia, but then it's going to go to complete paralysis. They're going to have problems with temperature regulation, particularly hyperthermia. They can posture. They can start, you can start to be posturing, progress into coma, and then into death. If you've got bleeding in the subthalamic, um, this is going to impact vision and eye movement. And if you've got bleeding in the cerebellar, you're going to present with a severe headache, often with vomiting. They'll have an inability to walk. They'll have dysarthria. And remember that's a speech disorder that's related to impairment of the muscles of speech, like the lips and the tongue, those types of uh, parts of our uh, speech. And then also disturbances in eye movement. 
Um, a sub subarachnoid hemorrhage is whenever we have bleeding into the cerebral spinal fluid filled space between the arachnoid and the pia mater. Um, is commonly caused by a rupture of a cerebral aneurysm, trauma, or drug um, abuse. And I don't have anything to add other than what's on this slide. Um, hemorrhagic CVAs, the majority of them happen in the circle of Willis. They can be saccular or a berry aneurysm, or they can also be fusiform aneurysms. And I've got a picture here on the side. And really, berry and saccular is really kind of the same thing, OK? Um, and that saccular or berry aneurysm is the most common type of aneurysm. Um, it accounts for about 90% of cerebral aneurysms. And the reason it's called a saccular or berry is it looks like a little sac or it looks like a little berry. About 40% of the people who have hemorrhagic CBA due to a ruptured aneurysm die within the first um, episode. Um, and about 15% of the remainder die with subsequent bleeding. The risk increases with age. Everything increases with age. All the risk does seems like. But anyhow, the risk increases with age and it's higher in women than men. Sometimes you'll have some warning symptoms if there's some ballooning, if the artery's going on. And if the artery's ballooning out and you're lucky enough to have that happen, you might see some symptoms show up and that'll give you some warning. And those symptoms would um, be as a result of the pressure on the brain tissue or um, from maybe some uh, little, little bit of leakage. But for the most part, people who have uh, cerebral aneurysms have no idea they have a cerebral aneurysm. And it's uh, considered to be a silent uh, killer for that reason. Um, so symptoms they you also might see would be um, focal neurological deficits, including cranial nerve deficits, nausea, vomiting, seizures, dyspneic. Um, some of the complications of an um, subarachnoid hemorrhage from an aneurysm is rebleeding either before we can go in there surgically and solve the problem or before we can start therapy. Another problem would be cerebral vasospasm, which is just where that uh, the blood vessels are going to narrow and spasm. And as a result of that, we can move on forward into an actual uh, cerebral infarction. And the greatest risk for vasospasm is six to 10 days after the initial um, bleed. And that is the last slide on this, um, on this collaborate. <laughs>